Thank you, and uh, thank you for your indulgence in having me back. <laughs> Nobody took me out during lunch, so that's, I'm still here. Um, uh, just actually, um, while uh, the, the team of the North just sitting down, I think one of the things we, um, we had an event a few weeks ago where we just internally with NHS England did a bit of a tech talk about where do we get to in the contracting round that happened and what had worked and what had worked you know, well, where were areas where we didn't perhaps achieve what we hoped to and how could we, how could we learn from that? Um, one of the things that, the reason for having that slot that we just had uh, today was that uh, one of the things that was really great about the way that uh, the team were just talking about how they were thinking through was they'd, they'd grasped something which we can often uh, skip over in the NHS, which is, you know, we often do the kind of the big reveal, it's very glossy, here's a new brave new world, and by the way, you know, on Friday you're all going to sign up, it's going to be fine. And I think what, they, what the team had just been teasing through was well, actually, even if we're going into a multi-year contracting round, it might well be that even if we think that the goal might be one of those models, we might not be ready for it on the first day. But actually, there might be some ways we can actually start meeting together. So rather than one commissioner, one provider, we might meet two commissioners and three or four providers who all provide in linked services. And we might change some of our kind of our regular processes of understanding how patient care is going, which would give us a real stepping stone towards some of the more structural things that they were particularly talking about. And we thought that's a really, um, it's a really helpful way. And I know that they're not alone. There are some other parts of some of our other hubs are also just thinking a bit about that and indeed in some cases kind of doing some of that. But we think that, you know, there has to be, even though we're entering into a, a, a longer term uh, contracts as we're coming forward, what, what, what we're trying not to say is, if it isn't all nailed down and you're fully ready and able to take every little bit of financial risk and sign on the dotted line for years as of the 31st of December, forget it, you can do nothing innovative until 2019. Because clearly that's just not the reality of where we're going to be. It's not the reality of where STPs are, uh, you know, either now or are going to be. It's certainly not the reality of you know, having to lock everything down in a contract such that there are no loopholes and all, and everyone kind of thinks the worst of what could go wrong. So I just thought there were some really practical steps in there just about, you know, we have regular continuous processes that we work and maybe we start by changing those processes and that helps us get to work cl more closely with each other, be sharing data, be tackling issues, be having visibility of issues, cross-provider issues uh, in our routine ways of working and out of that, could create a platform that allows us to do something a bit more structured. And there will be no problem with doing that. There'll be no problem with, you know, uh, starting out like that with an intention in your contract that we think, you know, it is our intention in writing this in our, in our SDIT, we'll say, you know, you know, this time next year, it's our anticipation will have been shadowing for a period. And if all goes well, we'll be reverting to a more formalized form of that later. You know, that's, that's something which, you know, if we were a yeah, if we were just a purely commercial-driven organisation, you might say, well, that sounds risky. But we are working this as the NHS, and I think there is a, a sense that, you know, there's a mixture of both kind of market but more collaborative ways of working. So I think practically finding ways of getting ourselves from here to there, recognising that some of these things are really difficult. You know, it, it's really difficult to land the inter-provider financial flows in a network care or, or, or operation. It absolutely is. So, you know, um, even though we aspire to move as quickly as we can, I think the, the success is going to be some bite-sized steps along the way. And I think it's really, um, I think uh, the team were really uh, very open to say this is early stages and early thinking. So please do, if you're at that workshop, contribute to help to shape that. Because uh, I think um, uh, it won't just be the North that takes that forward. It'll be a whole number of areas, I'm sure, that do that. Anyway, enough about that. Uh, so um, I, I was... Um, Wanted just to speak uh, a, a bit about uh, Sequin and just talk about some uh, some principles for Sequin and, and, and just again an early shape of all the all the same caveat supplies I was mentioning earlier. Early thinking really about how we see uh, Sequin developing uh, in the next uh, the next contract round, if you like. And um, so uh, what I wanted to um, start by saying is that that. Um, we know that um, actually our coming together on sequin, which should actually be a cause of great celebration with lots of real changes that are fantastically beneficial for patients actually in many, many areas, should be a real cause of celebration of what we do together. And actually, let's be honest, it has been pretty much a source of, of, of tension 
and it's been a source of tension actually since 2009 when the operating framework announced it but didn't announce funding associated with it. And so there's been a constant sort of, uh, I guess I'd liken it to, um, to a bit like, um, you know, uh, uh, an infant that's born at low birth weight and struggles to thrive. And so Sequins always had this degree of sort of uh, antagonism about it, which is a kind of, well, surely this is my money anyway, why are you just giving it back to me? Versus, uh, well, you just want money for a rope, and, you know, frankly, why are we bothering? So, so there is that kind of tension, which I think um, uh, has, has been there throughout Sequin, really. I mean, you think about when it started. I was thinking, when I was looking back on this recently, I was just doing a bit of... You know, your mind plays tricks on you. I thought, oh, well, Sequin was fine in the good old days when I had really, really big in, big kind of uh, funding increases and money wasn't really that tight. And actually, do you know what? In, in its first couple of years of Sequin, they, they were the years of, like, 0% price rises and minus 1.5% price rises. And, uh, you know, and essentially, the, the heart of the post-financial crash stuff was actually when Sequin was kind of born out of. So it wasn't, it wasn't ideal. <laughs> uh, it was born out of challenging times. Um, but one of the things I think, um, and we did, uh, one of the things we talked about, about uh, this event was, um, last year we all recognized that for, for reasons that were not within most of our control, like when the spending round happened, uh, with the Treasury and things like that. Uh, a lot of the planning guidance for last year was, was uh, late even by uh, normal standards. And as, you, as we talked about earlier, we are now living in the good or indeed challenge of being heard about that issue and saying, no, you're going to sort it out earlier and you're going to have it sorted three months before the contract goes live. So that's good. But, but essentially, we know that um, the, the challenge of delivering a sequence scheme that actually worked for providers but also was a good investment for patients was was really challenging actually not um notwithstanding a fantastic amount of effort i'm looking at um so some of the we've got some of the program of care managers here who work with the the crgs on and the the clinical input that went into developing of, of some of those schemes is really fantastic and so lots and lots of effort but but actually some tension around and just want to recognize that and i think um here are some areas where we, we recognise some real tensions. So there are some tensions where we think we can do something about it. There are some tensions that I think we, um, we will have to live with because they are structural tensions that exist in the NHS. Um, so uh, specifically, I think, so one of the feedbacks uh, that, that, that come was sort of, well, the thing about sequin is you just really get into grips with it and then it all changes again. And the area that you were focusing on now is no longer flavour of the month and you've got to do something on a completely different area and what the hell happens to the teams you've just got mobilised and get their ideas about what they're doing in that area and all of a sudden it's not important anymore. So, so how is that sensible in, in, in motivating people and really driving change? And, and, and just reflecting on this year, so, so right now, if you go through our, uh, the, the sequence that are currently around, um, from Specialist Commission for the last round, two-thirds of those are multi-year schemes. More than two-thirds of the investment is on a multi-year basis already. Uh, and that's a really... You, that may have missed you. We probably didn't communicate that very well. But actually, it was a really... It was an intentional thing. It was a very important thing because we think that many of the things we're trying to do with Sequin are quite transformational. And particularly when you've got a very concertina contract rounds and, you know, and then you're into, you're into the first quarter and before you know it, you're behind, on, behind the curve. Actually, it doesn't even give you a lot of time to it. Like, and because data lags as well, you can't even evaluate how good was the improvement you've made before you're now doing a different thing. So we tried to make a change on that. And so we've got you know, a big, big chunk of schemes that are two years. We've actually got three-year schemes, a couple of three-year schemes. We've got a four-year scheme as well that was launched last year. So there's a clue about it. When you're thinking, what will Sequin be about next year, there's a bit of a clue in that, <laughs> in that in an awful lot of those schemes will be where you've already started on an improvement trajectory and you've invested in Sequin, you will have the opportunity to uh, follow through on that trajectory through the sequence. So, so that was the first thing we have, we have been able to, to tackle. The second thing was, again, a worry that um, if sequin is coming and you need, need to invest costs to deliver it, uh, maybe some of those costs are recurrent. That's tricky. How do you then deal with that? Uh, if they're non-recurrent, not so much of an issue. Um, but, but actually what you don't want to have is basically be left with some stranded costs if, uh, if the sequin funding has stopped. So there may be things actually where... And clinical utilisation is probably a, a good example of this, where the, there will be a change in the way you spend your money. You may, for instance, spend a bit of money renewing your licence for that tool, 
but ultimately the the millions that the guys were sh showing that you freed up through changes to ward use and things like that will mean that overall actually you know you'll be spending differently but fundamentally you won't be spending more once the once the uh, sequin period is over but we do want to give support to things to really get them embedded and in business as usual so that we've got an exit plan for each uh, each each scheme in specialized and you'll note if you look at the published guidance every set every guidance has got a section on that and sometimes it says well, it'll be business as usual and the, the non-recurrent cost won't be needed anymore. Sometimes it says, we think that, so using an example would be what we're doing, what we've done for um, helping patients not get iron overload by having more automated exchange for sickle cell patients. What we've said is, um, the, the, the permanent solution of that is to split the tariff arrangements so that you get more payment for the thing that costs slightly more, the automated exchange, but ultimately it's way better for patients and cheaper for the system. And you get less if you do manual exchange because it costs less. Whereas at the moment, the tariff can't distinguish, so it averages them out, which means that if you do the right thing for patients, you make a loss every time. And if you don't do the best thing for patients, you make a profit. And that's not the right incentive, is it? So, we, um, so that's a good example where we've got a sequin in for now, and we've been working with the information center to try and create, and they have now created some code that allows us to do that split. And so we can see an endpoint there that's going to work for everybody. And so if you go through, that's another thing that we've tried to really, in taking feedback from what many of you have told us through the, the, the previous kind of commissioning rounds about SQL and what works, what doesn't, we've tried to incorporate some of that. Hopefully, uh, if you have a, another flick through, you can see that. I think if, if any of those exit plans give you cause for concern, do by all means flag those up to us and we're happy to uh, take that in and, and, and really think about those things, make sure we've got those landed right. Um, the third thing I think was, yeah, please, please involve us more and involve us earlier. Um, and, uh, and I think we're in, a, 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 we're in quite an interesting kind of position in this one in that um, if I were to go back a couple of years, our main involvement in developing a specialised sequel would be through the, the clinical reference groups. Now, they're drawn from many of your clinicians in this room. So, you know, we've got 1,600 clinicians, slightly different numbers now, I think, with having gone down to 42 from, from a, a, a larger number. But, um, you know, if you've got 1,600 clinicians plugged into and working on schemes, contributing to the evidence base, having some of the dialogue about what, what will work in your services or not, then there's quite a lot of provider input. But nonetheless, um, probably in those previous years, that was the focus. So if it came out the CRG, we thought, well, we've consulted with the sex, so, you know, fine, that's what it is. One of the things that we did last year was um, we wanted to um, be clearer about how much we should fund particular sequins and that what that would relate to. So, for example, there might be some sequins that just generally would, would be something you had to do that would be, say, a cost that would be per site that you had. And there'll be others that might be, a, the, the cost might relate to how many patients you were treating. Um, so there might be different drivers, actually, and get in the right shape to make sure that a sequin more than recovers your costs and gives you some incentive to it can be a bit tricky. And actually, sometimes clinicians are brilliant at the clinical side of the, the schemes, but actually, we need colleagues from the managerial side sometimes to help with some of that, that thinking. And, and we did last year actually uh, uh, get volunteers. I think NHS providers helped with uh, connecting us with volunteer providers who worked, 37 providers worked with us on the schemes that came out last year, just in testing out some of the, and probably to varying degrees as well, you might be one of them, you say, well, it's a fairly marginal, and others you might think, yeah, I was quite involved and, and, and whatever. But, but actually we tr try to use, uh, uh, use those relationships to try and test things out more than perhaps we have done in the past, and certainly more than, you know, had been done in corporately in sequin from, from, from days gone by. Um, and yet, I think it's probably fair to say that we, um, uh, one of the reflections from this year, and particularly when the schemes came out, um, notwithstanding, I think, the hepatitis C, for the reasons that Jonathan's alluded to earlier, that there were some things that happened fairly late in the, in the financial planning round that had major implications for the NHS, and we had to move quite quickly. But putting that to one side, um, with most of the rest, it, it, it seemed like we invested a lot more time to try and connect with you about that as a, as a sector. And yet, I guess, um, part of the dialogue, and certainly Chris Hopson and I had that discussion, was, yeah, but it didn't, no matter what you did, it didn't feel like that. It still felt like here is something that we've just kind of been landed on us, and, uh, and actually landed on us with only a few weeks till we've actually got to sign the contract, so it was all very rushed. And uh, 
you know, certainly um, the timing of when the final schemes came out was something that obviously was not something we had direct control over as linked to some, some wider things. I, I guess um, we all recognise that that was really uh, uh, unhelpful. And so uh, this thing about please, please involve us more and earlier, I think, it, I think we can recognise we did an awful lot more last year than we previously done, and hopefully that is... is, is is, is, is you can see some of the benefit of that in the way we've structured the, the, the way the schemes work. But also, we also recognise it didn't feel like that. Um, and so one of the other things came out, and I know uh, uh, talking to Adrian about this previously, was, was can we make sure that we have an, uh, really a proper and upfront dialogue about some of the principles that are applying here? Some of the, you know, not necessarily what does scheme, you know, 15 do and indicator three and that kind of detail, but, but more broadly, the broad principles of the overall shape of this, what you're trying to achieve by it, and can we have that kind of dialogue? And, and so really this event is largely as a product of, of thinking about some of that feedback. Um, so, so it was about the commission intentions generally, but specifically it was also about sequin. So hence sequin was really part of this. I think um, uh, one of the things that um, uh, I think when Jonathan comes back and might mention when it closes is that we're also thinking about specifically trying to do something for the, for clinicians as well uh, as we go forward. So um, uh, not just kind of on on the basis that you know people might network into CRGs and they can they can connect with colleagues, but actually trying to have some more dedicated time in the early stages of this planning round to actually really have a bit of a a proper kind of get underneath the bonnet of and, 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 and really have, a, have an explore of the sequence, how they're designed to work, what they're intended to achieve and stuff, and really give teams a, a bit more of a chance to do that in the same way that we are, so for the clinical teams. Um, so I guess here is the heart of probably one of the, the tensions is notwithstanding that issue about are, are we really just topping back up prices that are inadequate without sequin. Um, the other way of uh, thinking about uh, what we're doing every year is is... Um, the, 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 um, the picture on the left there is, um, that's, I don't know if, we're, I haven't got anyone from Warwickshire here, have we? Probably not. Um, so South Warwickshire General Hospitals Trust was the first, um, in my first director job in the NHS, it was the first uh, uh, hospital I worked with uh, in, in, that, in, that, in a commissioning role. And, um, and that's the approximate uh, annual spend with South Warwick General. You can see what it buys. So 60,000 people treated through emergency department, 36,000 non-elective inpatient spells going on, 30,000 electives. It delivers 3,000 uh, babies. It delivers more than three quarters of a million community uh, in, in, uh, community attractions like rehab, uh, intermediate care and those kinds of things, speech and language therapy, all kinds of things. And one of the, the big challenges for us is to realise that if we weren't doing sequin, we could buy a, a South Warwick General Hospital. If I think about that as a health economist, I think about how many quality adjusted life years will be gained through everything that hospital does and all of the clinical teams work in a community for a whole year. It's a hell of a, it's a, hell of a healthcare improvement, actually. It's a hell of a lot of lives saved. It's a hell of a lot of people who would have had you know, very long-lasting disabilities actually turned around and recovered. It's a tremendous contribution, actually, so that's a really significant investment. And actually, we're investing more than that when we design a sequence scheme. So it's really important to us to be able to say, how do patients benefit from this, this really significant investment? I know that, I mean, CCG colleagues will invest a whole load as well, but that, they're just kind of our numbers. So, so therefore, if you like, one of the key things that might help us in our conversation and not just be the same old conversation we're back in 2009-10 it is realised that we are thinking about things as a, as a patient-centred investment. And, and actually, um, we do want Sequin to work for you as, a, as providers, and we do want them to, for instance, contribute to your bottom line, but it also has to have a very visible and clear, tangible reason why patients will feel uh, happy that we've put the Sequin in, if you like. So not, not, not purely be a financial price topping up exercise. Um, so just giving you some... Uh, uh, thoughts about 2017 to 19. So um, the first thing to say is that um, that approach we talked about, which is work out how much we need to invest in order to over-recover any kind of cost you might incur uh, and make sure that that investment is proportionate to patient benefit, picking up the, the South Warwick kind of uh, dimension to that. Um, that payment approach we've, we've adopted um, 
we actually think on balance it is a better way of doing it than just awarding a random percentage of, of overall contract value. Because actually you could have a big contract but a quite small clinical service. And so if we say everybody gets 0.3 of a contract for doing heme track for patients, if you're a provider with very few patients with hemoglobinopathy but a huge contract, you'll get an enormous amount of money where your neighbour might be doing loads of work for way more patients, but because their overall contract value is smaller, they'll be getting less money and they may not be covering their costs. So we actually think the approach of having a more, uh, you know, a more considered view about how much we pay rather than just random percentage of overall contract value is a, is a, it, it's not always an easy thing, but it's probably a better thing in making the resources you've got proportional to the change you're going to deliver for patients, the benefit patients are going to get, and the costs that you might incur on the temporary basis for doing so. So, so that was the first thing, just in terms of directions. We do want to, we want to fine tune that, and we want to build on that. Um, but one of the things that we have picked up on, and I think um, there was, uh, there was some, uh, particularly some angst, I think, around Lashes playing around where. Uh, people had just kind of said, well, you know, we see sequin as a price top up and we, uh, and in some places it, there was an assumption of, well, we'll get all the income and we won't incur any costs and therefore that, there's two and a half percent of financial gap sorted out. And I think um, there was a challenge, a quite right challenge to say, we've got to be as one as a system on this and we've got to be clear about this. We've been saying now in our commission intentions, now this will be the fourth year we've said it, that sequin will incur costs to deliver because it is about delivering change. But we have to make sure that we and all of the planning assumptions in the planning guidance, the way that all the arms and body work, we're all really clear and we're clear locally. And so one of the pleas back when we had the conversation uh, again at the end of the last contract round was you've got to signal that early because actually it's no, if that message hasn't got through, you leave us in a terrible position if we have got a, a financial plan that looked like it balanced, but actually it was based on the premise that, you know, we can't really deliver the services within the tariff income. We can't find a way of getting to, getting to deliver it within the, in the income. But don't worry, we'll, we'll rely on 2.5% of sequin coming in as pure income. If, if, you, if you, there was kind of a rude awakening, I think, in some places where those assumptions have been made, and all of a sudden we're in a really tense situation. Uh, and it's not because either of us have got bad motives. It's actually because we've just taken a wrong steer early on. So this, if you haven't heard it already, this is the signal to say, when we're doing the next generation of the STP refresh and into the financial planning round, et cetera, our working together on those three gaps includes helping your services to break even within the core price uh, for those services. Now, Things are going to change with all that, actually, for most acute colleagues, because HRG4 Plus is coming along, top-ups are all changing. Uh, so in some cases, that means uh, care is, uh, the funding for care is cl more closely related to complexity. So that's going to help in, in many cases address some of those structural issues. That's not to say everything's perfect about the payment system. We know it isn't. And uh, getting the, the costs in line and the payment system in line and converged are certainly things that people with, uh, uh, you know, pe people in, in NHS England, NHS Improve, all the arms length bodies are, are exercised about and is an ongoing thing. But, but ultimately, what we're trying to say is you can definitely guarantee some return from sequin. But if we give you these as principles, then this is a, a at minimum. So at minimum, if you've got a, if you've got a sequin payment that is, uh, you know, is, uh, let's say, one and a half million pounds, then what we're saying is if you fully deliver on that, you know what, you should definitely think you could get half a million pounds contribution to your bottom line from that because actually our intention is to over-recover your costs by at least 150%. Now, in some cases, it will be more, but the, the idea is it shouldn't be less. Obviously, that's an imprecise science. It's typical costs. Again, they've been informed by conversations with many of you. So actually, it might be that you have unusually low or unusually high costs. And so the reason for changing from 125 to 150 high is partly recognise that, you know, um, there is this tension in how much return is, but also recognise that that's an imprecise science. And we do want to make sure that you're never out of pocket for doing the right thing for patients uh, through the sequin process. That's the, that's the goal. So um, if we can achieve that, then, then that's, what, that's what we're trying to do. Um, so uh, I guess the other implication for that, that this does contribute to a little bit, is that um, if we are giving, if we are basically, if you like, the, the funding that goes in per thing that you do has just gone up from, you know, 125 to 150, then what that means is, for a given level of sequin investment, there will be fewer things to do in order to achieve that level of overall investment. So, it looks like someone's trying to, trying to break in from the back there. 
or maybe they're banging their head against a wall, I don't know, because why couldn't you have fixed it in 2009? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, so that's, uh, that's one important thing in terms of the overall shape we wanted to uh, explain to you. Um, I know some of you all think, oh, that's really good news, that it's, it's a lot better than it was. Others you think that's nowhere near enough, and how can you possibly still live with the, the thing? And, and, and I know, uh, talking with uh, Martin, and he was like, well, you could just cancel it all together and just not have sequin at all, and just give us the money. And, and I understand that, but um, from the point of view of um, the patient-centered investment, if you look at what we've committed to achieve over the next three years for the changes and transformation we're doing, yeah, those, I don't want those patients who are gonna not get iron overload and not get all the health consequences of iron overload to get them because we decided to cancel all of that and just go back to giving them manual exchange. I don't wanna do that. I don't want to see the rollout of the, the better care for cystic fibrosis patients that means they won't have uh, they'll, they, they won't go off what their, their, their treatment is and have expensive rescue therapy that costs you lots of money and sometimes costs us lots of money. I don't want to see all that go by the by. So I think just kind of scrapping it all is a bad idea. Probably will just come back and bite us and certainly wouldn't be great for patients. So I don't think that's that's thing. But what we have been able to do is make uh, a, a decision about uh, changing the level of funding to make sure that we are more certain to over-recover those costs. The second... Uh, a uh, couple of areas is, is just to think about, um, and again, these are early ideas rather than, uh, you know, kind of things that are a pronouncement that we're just dotting the I's and crossing the T's on, is that um, we've already started, I think, last year, um, Hep C sort of forced us very rapidly into, into this, but we did uh, say when we took that initiative was that um, Hep C resulted in us saying that there may be some providers in the sector who will take on uh, leadership responsibilities to do to take on some really difficult challenges that we have and we'll bear some risk on that and actually you do bear some risk on the on the hep c sequin in a way that um, isn't common to lots of sequins um, and actually those people who are actually are we're asking more of in that way maybe we should still invest in sequin overall and we're not saying we should be reducing the amount that goes into quality investment but actually is not set in stone that every single, you know, e the way of splitting that is 2.5% for everybody in a very unifying work form way, regardless of the quality improvement that's happening. So um, that idea that there might be potential for a differential approach um, is something that we have uh, been thinking more about. And so, um, uh, you know, we, and, and that really links to the fact that we've got some trusts who are saying, do you know what, just give me a few areas of focus. I don't want a lot of things to have to do. And, and in some cases, they're really big organizations, maybe 10, 12,000 staff, who ordinarily you'd think will be able to manage quite a broad change program. But they're kind of saying, no, I, I, just, want, I just want a small number of things to work on because I've got lots of other things that are going on. Um, and I, and I, I'm, I'm sympathetic with that. But what we can't do, if we were sticking with pure 2.5 and then some people do very little and some people do a lot, We've broken that principle about what's good for patients, what's proportionate to the effort you're using. So, so actually, we could you know, give, give kind of 10 times the reward to one provider who only does a couple of sequence schemes that we might give to another. But we do have to recognize we have a very diverse uh, uh, set of services. And in some cases, we are, you know, we're, we're kind of 40, 50, 60% of contract that may be you know, getting into the three, four hundred million pound bracket. And in other cases, you know, that big long kind of, I think, um, you know, our top 20 uh, acute and 10 mental health providers are about 50% of that, uh, of that 16 billion spend. And, uh, and yet the bottom, uh, the bottom sort of 20% um, uh, 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 account for 5% account for of that spend. So, so we have got a real variety, both in scope of services and in size of services. So we have to do something that is flexible uh, in that sense. But, but there is potentially a notion that if actually some trusts only want to do a few areas of focus or aren't able to really commit to very much in the way of stretch or scale for patients, then, but others are really keen to go much further. Well, actually, we've got this, this 280 million pounds to invest. Well, why wouldn't we put our investment where the improvement for patients is? So we, we are thinking very carefully about that. And, and what we're trying to think about is how do we create, if we were to do something like that, how do we do that in a simple and slick and easy to transact way and not a hugely complicated, you know, bureaucratic or, you know, kind of owed you noticed procurement type of a way? Because we, we, uh, we don't think that that's going to be the solution uh, in the timescales we've got. And actually, frankly, we don't want to put a big transactional overhead in. But nonetheless, 
We do see a difference between some schemes where, um, and again, we've got some schemes that are in some providers but not all, and we'd like to see them in all. So heme track, for example, for hemophilia patients, this is an example of one I know where it's, it, it doesn't seem right to me that if you're a patient at some of our centres, you're getting better control, you're getting better monitoring, you're getting a whole different experience, and you just can't access that in other centres. There's no reason why that can't be available in all providers who provide those services, actually. So we could fix that. And there might have been reasons why in the first year it wasn't right for some people, that's okay, but we can catch, we can catch all the services up, because what we want there is a new standard of care that is better for everybody. And once we've got it kind of bedded in and mainstreamed, it will just become business as usual. Um, uh, but equally, there are some things where, um, where actually um, there is room for people moving at different paces. So patient activation schemes we co-designed with a number of you last year. And, um, and you know what? In some areas, you're just doing a few long-term conditions. In others, you'd be really keen to do loads. Well, that incurs a cost per patient done. There's fabulous evidence that patient activation does lead to better outcomes. There's really, really good evidence emerging from that, both from the states and from this country and other places. And... Uh, so we really have high hopes for that as something which patient-empowered care is really good, um, and we really want to encourage it. But equally, we know that you know, if some people want to go further and faster, well, we could make more funding available for those who are prepared to go further, for example. Um, so I think, you know, and we might say, for, uh, for example, well, we think of our 280 million, let's set aside 20 million pounds for patient activation, and actually let's make sure we're investing it in at least 10 providers, and then, we might say, well, you know, let us know if you're interested and let us know how interested you'd be and how far you'd want to go. And then we'll award it based on the, the strongest kind of proposals that are genuinely committed to going further because actually we might achieve more like that. So that's what we're kind of thinking about is, is that there yeah, could be a mixture between things that we just say we should try and get to universal and things where we'd say, uh, if this was Ixa knockout, I'd say you're playing your joker on this one. You know, it's something that you think, oh, this, um, we're really good at that. We should go to town on that. So I think... Um, that probably really dates me, actually, doesn't it? Kind of, kind of, there's a whole generation of people, kind of the younger people in the room, go, "What the hell is he talking about?" <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> kind of like play, yeah, kind of bonus card, if you like to say. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so that's a that's another area. So, just in terms of the overall themes um, of uh, of the sequin uh, that we're looking at for this year, and again, this is all subject to some change. You'll expect that um, the the sequins will be focused on delivering things like the changes in cancer, the changes in mental health, changing LD. And so, um, so again, expect the sequence to, to particularly speak to those areas, as you would expect. But um, if, you just, if we just look around some of these, so, so for instance, in network care, we already have, as you know, ODNs funded through, uh, through some sequence funding. We've had some new networks go live last year. So for instance, the Hep C networks, obviously, uh, were fully centralized last year. We've got... Um, uh, so hemoglobinopathy networks, I think, think there as well. We're looking uh, particularly at uh, some new areas for next year. So, for example, in rare tumours and sarcomas, we're looking at how do we make that MDT-based working, that network-based working, work across geographies. Um, and particularly for rare tumours, we're actually mainly to be across a very wide geography in order to have the best experts collaborating with one another. Again, um, some of those will be linked to things where we're doing a service review. We mentioned the review we're doing of PICU. Uh, and pediatric research, and again, we may set aside some funding to say we think that part of the answer will be uh, establishing operational delivery networks, and therefore we'll put some sequin investment aside to make sure that those networks generally have some protected ring sense funding and some milestones through which that they can, they can fully deliver. Um, we've done work on uh, earlier inv expert involvement, think about rheumatology uh, already, and uh, think about early supportive care with cancer, for example. Again, early involvement in, in, in the best options palliatively rather than going down the track of sometimes treatments that actually are having questionable benefit, but really um, uh, perhaps undermining the quality of care you might have in, 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 uh, for, for your prognosis. So, so there's some areas in that. Um, uh, the right intervention, the examples there will be things like we've done with the sickle cell, uh, the iron overload, where the tariffs don't quite work, but we can, we can use things in sequence to kind of fix that in the short term and make sure that uh, people do the right thing at the right time. Thinking about, say, in mental health, some of the recovery college work where the intervention actually uh, is, is more supportive of recovery. So how, how can we incentivize the right intervention? Um, right setting, lots of things in that ones that come to mind, the stuff we've done on uh, critical care in particular. Again, CUR, I know we keep coming back to it, but we do see that as essentially 
uh, mainstream as part of the way we want to do business as a commissioner for all services. So you can expect us to uh, be putting, again, continued emphasis on that. And so if you haven't already and you didn't over lunchtime, tackle some of the things that are worrying you about that or, help, or get connected with someone who can help you resolve those issues, then please do that because this wasn't just something we decided to do for a little while. It is actually something we fundamentally believe is a core part of uh, delivery of service. Um, with the patient empowered and personalised care, again, you can expect us to do uh, more of the same that we've, we've done with patient activation and really, really build on that. Productive and efficient care, we've, uh, we've got some stuff on that already, but uh, you know, we did stuff like the right device stuff last time where we just start in the device supply chain. We think there is scope to do stuff around medicines optimization uh, in, in, in that area. We think there's, there's scope to do stuff that helps to provide some, uh, some ring fence resources to really enable you to deliver some of the stuff Carter's gonna ask you to do anyway. Uh, and actually we do want to see uh, the, the the best, possible, the best possible care, both in terms of effectiveness and quality, but quality also means streamlined delivery that's better for the patient. Um, and then uh, we put in the middle there, um, uh, just in case anyone thought we weren't in the prevention business, um, we are, not necessarily in every part of the prevention business, as you'll know, uh, but uh, uh, you know, secondary prevention where we can, we can, uh, we can ameliorate some of the causes of, of, of ill health early on in the process, and tertiary prevention as well, where we, uh, we can enable someone to actually have a lower health impact as a result of their condition are areas that are very, very important for specialised care. And um, just talking with Kate uh, last week about, you know, there are some things we think we can do, for instance, around cardiology, the interventional and non-interventional cardiology, and where the evidence has taken us around that. And actually, if we can put some dedicated resource on that, we may be able to get better outcomes, uh, even, uh, even while addressing some of that unwarranted variation either UK variation or global variation, actually, in what the best performing health systems are achieving for patients. So, so that's a thematic sort of flavor, really. And I know if you, perhaps if you were talking to Donald earlier on, this, on, the, on the stall, you might have heard some more specifics in some of those areas. There are some very, you know, a few interesting and new areas. But I guess the point I was making is we are thinking more about building from what we've done and enhancing it rather than tearing it up and starting again. With two thirds of our schemes being multi-year commitment to change, then clearly that's the kind of approach we're trying to take. And we think that that will help you as provider sector actually to um, uh, feel like the change is more manageable. Also will allow us to work through the evaluation process because again, we're getting an NIHR involved. And uh, one, of the things, uh, one of the reasons Donald's heading up the sequence scheme is he is a health economist. So he's very attuned to, to that and, and, and how we actually evaluate what did we do and did it work. So, so we do want to be more evidence-based in, 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 in all that. All we know actually at the moment about sequence from the previous uh, evaluation that was commissioned was um, the one thing that we fundamentally struggle to do, which is the thing that drives most success is engaging clinicians before it starts. So actually the, the time compressed contracting window undermines the very one thing we know is the critical success factor to, for the delivery change. So we do want to this year make a better fist of that. And so hence we're thinking about another event. Um, so just some conclu concluding questions and thoughts. Obviously, a degree of continuity you've heard with 2016-17, although don't take that that there won't be anything comes out of the wider reviews and discussions that are happening uh, with, uh, with the directors in NHS England. These are what we're recommending into that process. Um, you can expect to see those links, and particularly around cancer and mental health. Um, we're kind of interested, and maybe this is something for the workshop, is that some of the some of the um, sequence that we've done, and, and, and again, you know, um, so probably CU1 and patient activation are two good examples of those where actually as well as the sequence itself, there has been a need for something else. So, you know, with patient activation, you need a license. With CUO, you needed a procurement framework. You actually needed some, we've built a national learning network for some of your to plug in with one another and, and to share across site learning and things like that. So, so actually with some of what we're doing, this applies to the car to review stuff as well as, uh, as, as sequin. Actually, there might be some things where what we need to pick up on is we need to do more than just put the incentives in at a local level. We need to think about what other overarching ways of supporting change. Um, and also, I guess there's an opportunity in the in the in the in the workshop now, really, to to discuss a bit more on some of the principles about the kind of initiatives Sequin provides protected resources for. Particularly, I think in a world where 
that Carter world where the blurring between, well, was this my risk or your risk anyway, is kind of, is, 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 is kind of being, being overlaid with, we've actually got to do something that gets the best outcomes for patients, for the best inputs for the system, and that, regardless of what, which organisation the, the boundary is in. So, so I think in those contexts, how do we make sure sequin, yes, as a quality incentive, sometimes leads to changes in who bears what risk, sometimes leads to uh, uh, costs that increase, but sometimes leads to costs that decrease. So, so what are some of the principles we need to get right and, and, and use that to guide some of our discussions so that when we're finalising a provider-specific sequin package, we could look at that and go back to that slide of Southwark General and say, I can hand on heart say, this feels like it's a good investment for patients because that's ultimately what we want to achieve. Thank you very much for listening.